Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. Today, Dr. Kelsey Mills, obstetrician gynecologist, is joining us to talk about postpartum vulvovaginal recovery. Now, regardless of if you have a vaginal delivery or a cesarean section, you are going to want to listen to this. In fact, you are going to want to listen to this if you are pregnant, so you can plan and know what to expect postpartum. We'll get to that right after this quick announcement. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. We are Sarah and Alicia, two doctor moms who are creating a community rich with high quality information to support people through the journey from pregnancy to parenthood. Our goal is to empower with knowledge and decrease the anxieties during this time in our lives. We cover topics from fertility through the fourth trimester with the odd birth story sprinkled in. Come join us on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood or check us out on our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca. Some of these podcasts have been sponsored, which allows us to continue putting out free, amazing content. But don't worry, this won't affect our advice or recommendations. And we only partner with companies we know and trust or have come highly recommended to us by you, our listeners. She Found Health is meant for general medical information only. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The information you hear does not apply to every situation. If you have questions or if you've received different advice, please contact your healthcare provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions that you may have regarding a medical condition. The views expressed by She Found Motherhood and our guests are not representative of any institution with which we are affiliated. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. Today, we have the lovely Dr. Kelsey Mills talking to us about vulvovaginal health after delivery. Dr. Mills, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, thanks very much, Alicia. I'm really happy to be here. I am a obstetrician and gynecologist here in Victoria, British Columbia, and I am thrilled to be here today to talk about uh, some overall themes in terms of vulvar and vaginal health after a cesarean birth or after a vaginal birth. We're going to try to talk about uh, how women heal after having their baby, some common things to look out for on the healing path. And we're going to also try to talk about some tips and tricks for improving your healing after birth and what to look out for once you have come home with your baby. Awesome. So why don't we get into it? Now, we will talk about um, the vulva and the vagina and how they heal regardless of mode of delivery. So either vaginal delivery or cesarean section, there are certainly some common themes. Specific to vaginal deliveries, however, why don't we start by talking a little bit about what pregnant people fear, probably one of the biggest things they fear is around kind of vaginal tearing at delivery. Sure, Alicia. So that's a great question. And I think the first thing I would want to say to your audience is that the majority of women will have a vaginal birth and the majority of women will sustain some type of tear of the vulva or vagina, especially if you're a first time person having a baby. Uh, So we know that there are some things that might increase your chances of having a larger tear and oftentimes maternity providers will talk to their uh, patients about these uh, issues. So we know, for example, from studies that women who are at a older maternal age or who are birthing a larger baby, who are a first time mom, or women who have a forcep or vacuum delivery may have an increased chance of having a vaginal tear or a significant vaginal tear. So let's talk a little bit about kind of vaginal tears. There's kind of four grades of vaginal tears that um, people sustain during labor. That's right. So of course it is always possible, especially for a person who is having their second or third baby to have no tearing at all. So then that woman has had an intact perineum or no tear. The next possibility is what we call a first degree vaginal tear, and that is just when the um, inside of the vagina, what we call the vaginal epithelium, has a split or a tear in it. It can also mean some women might have a labial tear or tear just with the skin around the opening uh, of the vagina. And so that is a first degree tear when there's no muscle involvement. And that is often the easiest type of tear to heal from. 
uh, and your care provider usually may put a couple of, s of stitches in for you. Uh, and there are even some first degree tears where if they're really minor, some care providers may talk to you about not stitching those. So that's the first type of tear. The second type of tear is probably most common for first time mums and that's called a second degree tear. And that's when the vaginal epithelium has a laceration and part of the perineum, what we call the bulbal cavernosus muscle, which is a muscle that really provides a lot of support to the vagina, where that muscle is torn or partially torn. And that is commonly repaired by your family doctor, midwife, or obstetrician. And women do recover very well from that as well. I know that, Alicia, you guys have done some information about episiotomies as well. And most commonly when an episiotomy is made, that will also be considered a second degree type of tear. Beyond a second degree tear, then we have a third degree tear, which is when a woman sustains a laceration that goes through the vagina, through the bulbal cavernosus, and includes part of the sphincter or muscle around the anal canal. That is more commonly seen in first time moms, big babies, or with a forcep delivery. And we try very hard to avoid those types of tears because they can take longer to heal and can cause women more discomfort in the healing process. And that's one of the reasons if we suspected you might have a third degree or fourth degree, which we'll talk about tear, that we might discuss an episiotomy with you at that stage. Absolutely. So I'm not aware of any maternity provider who would ever recommend routine episiotomy. The literature there really uh, is clear that we should not be uh, making episiotomies for all women. Uh, but there are certainly some circumstances in which uh, your provider is trying to help you make the best decisions for your birth and to help you birth in the safest way and where your provider may recommend an episiotomy to try to avoid a tear through the anal sphincter. And then the final type of tear that is extremely rare is a fourth degree tear and that is a complete laceration through the vagina into the rectum. And that is a tear that would only be repaired by a surgeon. We always do that at our center in the operating room. And those tears can be very difficult to uh, recover from for some people and can be a prolonged recovery, but they are rare and um, certainly are not common. So we've talked about the different types of tears and we've added an episiotomy there and when we might consider doing that. What about kind of healing from vaginal tears? So that's also another great question. And I think it's something that women you know, should do some reading in advance about and be sort of mentally prepared about because that can be challenging for women. You've just had a new baby, you've had this whole new birth experience, and then you have to go home and also be able to heal uh, for yourself. So certainly most simple tears will heal within the first couple of weeks. And a, a very simple first degree tear might heal within seven to 10 days because it's skin healing. But more complicated tears, especially third or fourth degree tears, can take up to six weeks or even longer to heal for some women. So we know that there are some risk factors that can increase your chances of having a more difficult time healing or having poor healing. Those include smoking cigarettes, having an infection, maternal um, obesity, malnutrition, poor hygiene, having type one or type two diabetes. And so those are some of the things that if you have some of those risk factors, your care provider may be offering you more frequent checks and you may also be wanting to keep a closer eye on your healing progress. So what are some things that we can do to improve or kind of promote that healing more effectively? Right. And a lot of people who are having births will ask questions about this and do quite a bit of reading around this. My first recommendation or word of wisdom is to really be patient with yourself. Your body has gone through an incredible, you know, journey and you've had this birth and now your body has to heal from this. So this is not going to take one or two days. And for women who are used to being up, running around, it can be challenging to really be patient and rest to promote healing. You've got two of those people right here in front of you. <laughs> you sure do. Uh, but really be patient and be generous with yourself and put yourself first. That's my first word of advice. Certainly immediately after recovery or after your provider has put the stitches in if you need that, 
uh, we will offer you an ice pack almost immediately in the hospital and, and ice can be very helpful to avoid swelling on the stitches and, and swelling and edema in the tissues. Some of my patients find that if they raise the foot of the bed when they're in hospital or at home, that that can help with dependent or edema or swelling in the vulva or vagina. I strongly recommend that women are using a shower, hope preferably with a detachable shower head where they can rinse the vulva at least once a day, but more is better. And so some women find peeing in the shower when they first get home is the easiest and then rinsing with, you know, just clean water is a really common thing that women will do to promote healing. Or using the Perry bottle that oftentimes you get at during your labor delivery process or you can order them online as well. Absolutely. So some people may not have a, a shower head that detaches at home and so using that Perry bottle is a great option. And you can use that Perry bottle while you're actually peeing on the toilet as well. Exactly. It just helps to dilute down that um, the urine which sometimes can be a little bit stingy on those tissues. Exactly. Especially if you've had first degree tears higher up around the urethra where, where the urine comes out it can be really helpful to use a a, a perineal bottle. The other uh, option that may help as well is that many pharmacies will sell a little sitz bath that fits on your toilet so that you can fill that with water to a temperature that you feel comfortable with and you can just sit on that you know several times a day to keep your stitches soft and clean and to keep good hygiene in the area. Some patients ask me about using Epsom salt or just kosher salt or or, you know the large grain salt at home and I think that that's a great idea if you're comfortable with that. Salt often can help draw inflammation out of the tissue and can reduce swelling. And so for people who are comfortable to do that, I think that's a great idea. Um, And I was reading up on this topic and found that there is some evidence that actually using colder water in a sitz bath might be associated with reduced pain for women. So that's something to keep in mind as well. I think avoiding tight-fitting clothing that's tight against the perineum or tight elastic band is important. Women who are, who are able to change position frequently because sitting upright on the stitches on a hard chair will be very uncomfortable for a lot of women when they first get home. So reclining, changing your position, using a donut ring to take the pressure off of the perineum can be really important, especially if you've had a larger tear. And something that women often can forget about because they're so busy taking care of their baby is making sure that they are to having good control of their pain. And so making sure that you're using acetaminophen, which goes by the trade name of Tylenol, or an anti-inflammatory like Advil or Aleve can be really helpful. And I tell my patients, especially if they've had a larger tear, to make sure that you're using a pain medication every four to six hours to stay on top of the discomfort because oftentimes it's hard to catch up with the pain from a repair at night when it gets worse if you've sort of not been taking any pain medicine through the day. Hey Sarah. Yep, Alicia. Do you remember that first time you had sex after your first baby? Boy, do I ever. So scary. We didn't quite succeed the first time. Well, you know what they say, if you don't succeed, try again? Yep. But next time, maybe try with some more lube and some vaginal estrogen. Am I right? You sure are. A lot of postpartum people do not know that their low estrogenic state while breastfeeding will affect their vaginal mucosa. They also don't know that the low estrogenic state will give them lots of hot flashes. It's like a mini preview of menopause. So true. But there are some things to do to help your vagina recover postpartum if you're experiencing signs of vulvovaginal atrophy due to that decreased estrogen in your system. There sure are. First of all, try lots of lubricant. If that doesn't work, you can try replacing some of that estrogen locally. Personally, we're a plant-based family, so I prefer Estergyne, which is a plant-derived vaginal estrogen cream. Yep, agree. This is a great option if you're needing some help with symptoms like dryness, itching, or vulvovaginal discomfort, or pain with intercourse. It helps to plump up those vaginal tissues again and allow for more self-lubrication. Also, it's fragrance and alcohol-free. I also sometimes recommend it on more complex vaginal tears to help them heal a bit faster as well. Agree. But this isn't something that you use forever, is it? Nope. It's for short-term use only. And, as with any medication, we like to use the lowest dose necessary to manage your symptoms. 
Also, we like to remind everybody to check with your own care provider to make sure this is an appropriate use for you. Also, if you are having painful intercourse or you don't feel like you're healing up properly, get a proper exam from your provider. Agree. Please don't suffer in silence. Ask for help, and if appropriate, give Estragine a try. I know it worked for me. Hence my quick second pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Also a good tip to remind you to make sure you're using appropriate birth control if you aren't quite ready to get pregnant right away. So something else that I think is really important to talk about for patients who have had especially a third or fourth degree tear is management of the bowels after delivery. So a lot of women or patients may experience significant constipation in their first trimester or early second trimester of pregnancy. But after delivery, people can be very dehydrated, your body has been through a lot, and the first bowel movement might be delayed a couple of days after birth. And so I strongly recommend to my patients that they're drinking a lot of fluids, that they're staying really hydrated, and that I encourage them to be making sure that they're taking, you know, fruit, vegetable, fiber, eating a balanced diet, and taking stool softeners as needed and talking to their care provider about stool softeners, especially if they've had a significant tear. Because what we want to try to avoid is straining or pushing against the sutures after delivery. And so making having an easy bowel movement can make that a lot easier. And one thing I often tell postpartum patients is everybody's scared of their first bowel movement, regardless of if you've had a tear or not. So get a cloth and put it on with some warm water and then just support your perineum, so the area between your vagina and your rectum, while you're having that bowel movement. And it'll just give you a little bit more confidence. I think that's a great tip. You know, another sort of thing that I tell people who have had a tear is a lot of people are worried about the stitches. They can feel the stitches. They might be able to see them with a mirror if they look. But I really recommend you avoid touching the area because bringing contamination from bacteria from your hands to the area may increase the risk of infection. So avoiding touching or contaminating the area is important, which is why rinsing with clean water after going to the bathroom and just patting dry can can be helpful as well. Some of my other patients also talk about using what they call a padsicle or freezing some pads to have as a cooling option to wear after they've had their birth. And so that is a great idea. I don't generally recommend that people use topical anesthetics and the evidence around that is limited. Those would be a a numbing spray or something like that. I would prefer my patients to be using medication by mouth to help with pain or inflammation. Yeah, and the other thing to think about is oftentimes you're wearing pads for quite a long time and so once your bleeding settles a little bit, getting a panty liner that doesn't have that kind of that synthetic weave over top, so just like a, a natural cotton a panty liner, once your once your bleeding is settling enough that you can manage with that can be helpful because that kind of those those um those weaves on the like the bigger pads can be irritating to your skin after a long period of time. I think something that also is important to talk about after recovery from a vaginal birth is management of hemorrhoids, which are very common, for especially for women who have pushed for a really long time or women who had hemorrhoids already in the pregnancy. Uh, so hemorrhoids can be quite aggravated after a, a vaginal birth. And so talking to your care provider about using medications, stool softeners, or suppositories can be important. My caveat there is that if I have a patient who's had a tear involving the rectum, the muscle in that area, then we're not using any suppositories inside for six weeks until that area has healed. But a trick I tell women that was taught to me by a general surgeon is that oftentimes if you have significant hemorrhoids, I was taught by a general surgeon that if you can put some sugar on a pad, oftentimes those sugar crystals will help pull the inflammation out of the surrounding hemorrhoidal area and can help heal things as well. And who doesn't love a little sugar, am I right? (laughs) Um, Also, if you want more information on constipation and hemorrhoids we have an entire podcast on that topic so go check that out if you need a little bit more information around that all right so we've talked about vaginal deliveries we've talked about vaginal tearing and how to care for it afterwards One thing we really want to make sure that you are aware of is when to actually ask for help. So what are the things that you should be watching for that if they come up that you should get 
seen by your care provider relatively quickly? That's a great question, Alicia. So what I tell patients who've had a significant tear is that oftentimes the healing process can seem slow to have patients, but what they should be noticing is a day-by-day gradual improvement or moving in the right direction. Some things that will worry me are if a patient tells me that everything was going really well and then a week or 10 days or 14 days later, they started to have increasing pain, increasing swelling, or it seems like their healing is going backward. That to me begins to sound worrisome for a possible infection. And so if your healing is not progressing forward, then that is a big sign that you should be talking to your care provider. Also, if you note that there's a foul odor, if the stitches are feeling more painful, if you're noticing discharge or drainage from the area, or if you're having a fever or chills or other symptoms where your body feels like it's fighting an infection, like flu-like symptoms, you need to be seen uh, very quickly by a provider. And if you can't be seen in a situation where you have a fever post-birth, you need to go to your nearest hospital and be assessed. And I think the only caveat I would say with that is day five is the worst for everything. Mm -hmm. The worst for baby blues, the worst for nipple pain, the worst for, I found, perineal pain after my vaginal delivery. So I think we're talking about, you know, day seven, day 10, day 14, if these things are getting worse. Now, if you're significantly worried, of course, you should be seen, no problem. But um, but just expect those first few days can be a bit challenging. And day four or five often is just a little bit more sore because you're home and you're doing more with your baby. So that, that can be normal. But fevers, abnormal, foul-smelling discharge, 100% get seen. Absolutely. So now let's move on to a subject that is regard- irregardless of how you delivered. So whether you had a cesarean section or whether you had a vaginal birth, the vaginal mucosa or tissue can change because most people are now in an anestrogenic state. They're in a state due to the birth of their baby that their estrogen levels are low and that has significant impact on our tissues. It sure does, Alicia. So what happens is women go from this state in pregnancy where their hormone levels are really high. They have very high levels of progesterone. They have high, sometimes high levels of estrogen. And then the baby is born and our bodies are very smart and our brain switches off those high progesterone levels when we breastfeed so that What Mother Nature is doing is causing breastfeeding patients or breastfeeding people to not get a period to try to reduce the chances of pregnancy when they've just had a newborn baby. So that's what's happening. And when you're in this sort of pseudo menopause state, all of your estrogen levels really plummet quite low. And some pregnant women will even have some hot flashes after delivery. What happens to the tissue in the vagina and vulva is that it can become very dry and very tender. And so I hear this a lot from women who have had either a cesarean birth or a vaginal birth, that when they go to try and be sexually active with penetrative intercourse after their birth, and for all people that can be at a different time. I have some patients who can do that comfortably one month out, and I have some patients who you know, that may take six months or even longer before they would consider that comfortable. But the vaginal and vulvar tissues can be very dry. And when we look at people on examination, they can look thinner, they can look more red. And so what this is similar to what tissues will do when people are in menopause with lower estrogen states. And I often recommend to people who are having discomfort with intercourse or who are having a prolonged journey with healing after their delivery that people can use some estrogen in the vagina or in the vulva. Many, many, many practitioners do this. We consider it safe. These are very low dose medications. They do not increase your risk of breast cancer or stroke or getting a blood clot after pregnancy. And they are a much tinier dose of estrogen than, for example, what might be in a birth control pill. And in Canada, we have four options to be able to put estrogen in the vagina or on the vulva. 
And postpartum, I commonly use three of those choices. Uh, so in Canada, we have two creams that people can use, and your provider might be able to talk to you about this. There's um, a cream called Estragine, which is a plant-based estrogen cream that can be used in the vagina or on the vulva. And there's also a cream called Premarin, which is derived, which, which is animal derived, that can be used in the vulva or vagina. And these estrogen creams are very low dose and can really improve women's symptoms of pain with intercourse or dryness. These may also improve bladder symptoms if women have irritation or feel like they're peeing all the time after birth. Of course, you would want to be seen by your provider to make sure that you don't have a urinary tract infection if you had symptoms like that. The other option is a little estrogen tablet, which is called Vagifem. And I use that often as, as well for women who are having pain with intercourse. And I want to reiterate that women who have had a cesarean birth can have just as much, if not more, discomfort, interestingly, than women who have had a vaginal birth. So please talk to your provider if you're scared of, your, you know, of having penetrative sex after you've had your baby or if you've tried and it was a no-go due to pain. There are lots of things in addition to lubrication, in addition to relaxation, that we can do to help. And local estrogen is considered safe. Yeah, and I think another important thing to mention is if you have had a vaginal tear and it's you're having intercourse but there's one spot that's quite uncomfortable, please come and see us and let us know because sometimes that tear, if it's inside the vagina, can heal in a way that is very sensitive and we can help you with that in the office. So if there is one area that is particularly uncomfortable, I remember this woman who I met who came back for her second pregnancy and said that she had, you know, she, she was having intercourse, but it was very tender on one side. And it's because that area hadn't healed and she'd been suffering for a year and a half with this. So please speak up and come and talk to us because we can have a look and see what's going on. I think that's a, a, a great point because oftentimes women are trying to look with the mirror or have their partner look or feel for themselves uh, when really it's, e it's easy for your care provider to do the exam and to try to help you find out what's, what's making you uncomfortable and to try to help troubleshoot that with you in terms of options to manage that. And we see postpartum vaginas all <laughs> the time. So you do not need to be shy about it. And we can differentiate what's a normal healing and what looks abnormal and how to manage that. So do not be shy. Do not suffer unnecessarily. Ask for help. I totally agree. Great. All right. So there we are for those pieces of the puzzle. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to chat about today, Dr. Mills? You know, I just think that my number one word of advice to women who have birthed by whatever method is that most women will have some sort of recovery process from your birth. And so my big advice to you as a mom myself, as somebody who has been through it, is to really just be patient with yourself, to be generous with yourself, to rely on others to maybe do the laundry, the groceries, the dishes, to really prioritize yourself and your baby during the postpartum period, especially for the first couple of weeks, because that can go a long way. And allowing yourself the time that you need to heal, and it's different for everybody. So comparing yourself to other friends who you know is probably not gonna be helpful in your own journey. So allow yourself the time you need, seek medical attention from your doctor or midwife if you feel like something is not going right there's lots of things we can do to help and i'm going to channel dr sarah here who as anyone who listens regular to this podcast knows got pregnant with her second very shortly after her first so before you're planning on having intercourse if you do not want to get pregnant right away please talk to your care provider around birth control options that's a great point thanks yeah. she brings it up quite often yeah. Hey, well, thank you so much for joining us today. I think that was all wonderful, helpful advice. And uh, we will see y'all later. Have a great day. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca and to sign up for our community for weekly bump blasts. Make sure to check us out on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood and head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review and a five-star rating. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, take a pic of yourself listening to it and share it on social. Make sure to tag us on it so we know to keep making them.